you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, this paper that I've been working on with my colleagues uh, John Rand and Fintarp and also uh, Tuyen at the CIEM in um, Hanoi. And um, we're, just to provide an overview of the paper before I begin, what we're looking at is we're investigating the relationship between exporting and productivity. And we're focusing on the difference in that relationship in the pre-accession to WTO versus post-accession to WTO. We're using a firm level panel data set to do this, which is a rich panel data source from Vietnam for the period 2001 to 2010. Um, and we're focused on separating out the productivity effects due to self-selection um, compared with the effects that are, um, trying to isolate the effects that are due to learning and learning by exporting. And we also focus on and try and disentangle some of the underlying mechanisms here, um, looking in particular at uh, the trade regime and how that impacts on this, on this relationship. So we look at trade costs and protection um, as two um, as, two, as, two, as two forces that might be driving, driving these relationships. Um, just to give you a preview of our results, our results suggest that uh, protecting sectors in order to help firms prepare for export markets seems to be a good strategy in promoting participation um, in export markets, but learning is much less likely in these environments, and um, I'll show some results to suggest this. We also have an, a, an additional part of the paper which looks at the mechanisms through which learning actually happens in the post-WTO period. Um, we explore in particular technology transfers and we find some evidence to suggest that this is one of the mechanisms through which firms learn. So um, to provide some motivation, this is the second session on learning by exporting at the conference, so a lot of this uh, motivation has been provided already. Um, there is a, quite a large body of literature that looks at learning from exporting in developing country contexts. Um, and you know, one of the big findings here is that it's, it's not clear whether it's, it's um, selection into exporting that um, explains the fact that export firms are more productive, or whether they start to learn from exporting, and this is a productivity spillover that they gain as a result of being involved in export markets. So there's mixed evidence of this um, across a variety of different um, um, African countries, and um, we've seen that um, today and yesterday also um, in these sessions. Um, one of the gaps in the knowledge um, is just in looking at the mechanisms through which learning happens, and we try and address some of these gaps um, by looking at trade barriers and protection and seeing um, you know, how that impacts on this relationship, as I've said, and also try and contribute to the, our knowledge of how firms actually learn by exporting. So our empirical approach is we stand, follow the standard in the literature. Uh, we first of all try to detect um, self-selection. So um, the seminal paper here, the Clarita Zital paper in 98, proposes two testable hypotheses um, that are consistent with self-selection. Um, so entry exporters should experience positive productivity shocks in the period prior to entry into foreign markets. And also firms experiencing uh, negative productivity shocks should cease exporting in the subsequent period. And if we observe this, then um, this provides us with some indication that there's a self-selection process at work. To detect self-selection, we just use um, a standard measure of total factor productivity using an index number of approach. And we use this measure to then construct some binary indicators of whether a firm has a positive or a negative productivity shock before, um, between any two given years. We then estimate, a, a, we just run a, a fixed effects regression model where we look at the decision to enter into export markets in the first instance or the decision to exit export markets. Um, and we regress this on the TFP shock, controlling for a number of factors such as the size of the firm to capture the fact that larger firms may be better able to incur that sunk cost of entry and also factors that might, determine, might be related to the underlying technology such as labour productivity, capital labour ratios and so on. So in this regression we control for um, sector fixed effects and all of the usual controls, time fixed effects, problems fixed effects. So if we find a positive coefficient here, then we have evidence for self-selection. So to detect learning by exporting, um, we um, use a one-step approach where we estimate a production function, um, and within that production function, we control for um, the various um, selection parameter or selection variables um, that we have included in the previous model at two lags. Um, and we, what we're interested in here is the coefficient on beta one which is the indicator of export status in the previous period. And we want to check and see whether that is related uh, to productivity within this model. 
Of course, one of the problems with this dynamic model is that we have the lag of the, the output um, in this equation, so this complicates the econometric estimation if we want to use our fixed effects estimator. Um, for now, we've not gone through all of the steps to trying to address this, because it's an early enough um, paper. Um, to begin with, we just exclude the lag. Um, we then include it and see if our results change, and we also estimate the model using this random effects estimator with the one lock adjustment and we find the same result. Our preliminary estimates using the Blundell and Bond approach um, suggest that, that our results hold, but it's, it's, it's not completely crucial. So um, the, the data set or the, the context that we're looking at is the Vietnamese context and um, of course the Vietnamese economy began to open up right to back in the 1980s um, with a range of policy measures that involved trade liberalisation but also liberalisation of investment laws, uh, promotion of foreign direct investment. So there's this gradual process particularly throughout the 2000s that um, led to the removal of the export, ta um, export taxes, non-tariff barriers, um, and through the negotiation of various trade agreements, which ultimately led to um, accession to the World Trade Organization in 2007. You see significant growth in exports and imports over the, over the period, besides the dip here in 2009. These are aggregate, um, aggregate figures that we have taken from the national accounts data just to illustrate that trend. The data set that we use um, is the Vietnamese Enterprise Survey collected uh, by the General Statistics Office. Um, the data cover the population of all registered enterprises in Vietnam with 30 employees or more. And we have then a, a random sample of the, the smaller firms below 30 employees. What we do here is we focus on um, a select group from that enterprise survey. We focus on trade intensive sectors. And this is consistent with what uh, Caritas does. So um, we con consider a sector, a trade intensive sector, if they're um, a they're a two-digit sector where exports account for more than 10% of output in any one given time period within our data set. Uh, we combine our data with export and import data at the, the four-digit level from the Comtrade database. And we also use a panel data set to look at these issues because we want to kind of abstract in this paper from reallocation effects due to the typical firm turnover that you see when you have trade liberalization. We also run robustness checks using the unbalanced panel and we get the, get the same result. In addition, we combine our data with a, with a new specially designed module um, that's part of the, general, the GSO survey that we included in the GSO survey in 2010 and 2011, where we um, interview, um, add an extra kind of set of interviews to around 8,000 firms, looking specifically at technology transfers and asking firms how technology um, is um, transferred within, within their enterprise. So we have some additional kind of results that we, or analysis that we do using these, these data. So just to give you an indicator of the, the export firms in our data set, um, we don't have an actual variable on whether a firm exports, so we go to the tax data. So we have a, a variable on whether they pay um, um, export taxes. Um, and you'll see for all firms, this is um, increasing over the time period, um, and in particular for the trade intensive sectors in the balanced panel. So there's a lot of these firms that are actually starting to export over this, um, over this decade in Vietnam. Um, in terms of the characteristics of the firms that export, what we see is that the, the characteristics are different in the pre-WTO period and the post-WTO period. This is just a, a simple um, regression, fixed effects, um, linear probability model of whether a firm exports. Um, and we see that the firms that export, if we look at the balance panel, they tend to be um, more productive firms that export, and that's the case in the pre and the post period. Um, there's no difference pre and post-WTO in the balanced panel. Um, they tend to be more productive on the TFP measure um, post-WTO, um, but we also find that they're more likely to be foreign-owned enterprises. So that's just to give kind of a picture of the characteristics of the export firms that are in our data set. So the first set of empirical results we present um, are detecting the self-selection and learning by exporting effects. So we estimate the model that has, whether you're an entry exporter, regressed on all of the various characteristics, all of the various fixed effects, um, and we're looking at the impact of whether, or we're looking at whether or not these firms experienced a positive productivity shock before they entered the export markets. And we see throughout um, for the entry exporters that this is the case, and we see that it is a greater effect in the uh, post WTO period. Um, we also do the same for exit exporters, and we find that um, only in the post WTO period is there's this selection back out of 
um, the export market following a negative productivity shock. Um, so, I mean, one possible explanation for this is that perhaps in the pre-WTO period, the sunk cost of entry into export markets is much higher than in the post-WTO period, where it's more easy to, to go in and out of export markets, perhaps. Um, so as a result, um, even after a negative productivity shock, maybe firms are less likely to exit the export markets in the, in the pre-accession um, period. In terms of detecting your learning by exporting, um, we have a couple of various models here. So uh, the first two columns are um, just, um, so we include this WTO interaction in the second column here. In this third and fourth column, we have the, the, just the level variable and then including a WTO interaction with these controls for selection. And here we have the lag of the dependent variable included. Um, in all cases, we find this positive relationship between the lag of export and productivity. Um, but it's entirely driven by the post-WTO period, as you can see with the interaction term here, with the WTO in all, in all cases. So what are our key findings from these um, results? Well, our productivity differences between exporting and non-exporting firms um, appears to depend somewhat on this uh, prevailing trade regime. So under the more strict regime, pre-WTO, export firms are less productive and they're less likely to self-select in and out. They do self-select, but they're less likely to do so, not to the same extent as the post-WTO period. Um, under the liberalized, more liberalized regime, export firms are more productive and self-selection is more obvious. So, um, so in terms of trying to disentangle this a bit further, we're going to look at the, the role of the, the trade regime. So um, what kind of mechanisms might be in place here that are preventing firms from, from, being, from learning? What kind of um, mechanisms might be in place that are imposed by the trade regime that might make self-selection less likely? So we consider two things. We consider, first of all, um, the fact that trade restrictions might make exporting a lot more costly than it would be without these trade restrictions. Um, so if this is the case, we should observe less selection into exporting in sectors where costs um, are lower, um, or where costs are higher. And we proxy trade costs um, in this analysis using an indicator for low versus high export sectors constructed using the aggregate data on the basis that if you're in a high export sector, it's kind of a signal that it's a, um, there are lower costs associated with exporting in that sector. Um, we also um, look at um, whether protection through the form of barriers to imports in the pre-trade regime might um, impact on the selection into export markets for some firms. So if you have higher levels of import tariffs or if you're in a more concentrated sector that's protected through some other means, um, this could actually give firms more protection and, um, and allow them to um, enter or start exporting as a result. And if this is the case, we should absor observe more selection into exporting in protected sectors in the pre-WTO period when the costs of exporting are, are higher. Post-WTO selection um, is probably less likely in the concentrated sectors where they need the competitive pressures that, um, within the domestic market in order to be able to do well on export markets, so we should observe a different result there. So in terms of how we do this, as I said, we construct a variable for a high cost um, of exports and we interact it with this positive shock to productivity and the negative shock to productivity down here. And what we do see is that um, in the pre-WTO period, there is less selection into exporting if you're in a high cost export sector. And this happens in both periods. Um, and so this kind of suggests that this high cost of exporting is, 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 um, is one of the, the reasons um, that's inhibiting um, selection. Um, we do the same for a measure of a high tariff sector versus a low tariff sector. And what we see in the pre-WTO period is that um, it doesn't make any difference really to our results in, the, in terms of entry, looking at entry exporters. But we see this positive shock in the high tariff sector is associated in the high tariff sector with, um, so there's a positive um, association between being in a protected sector and then entering into the export market. So this kind of suggests that selection to a certain extent into export markets um, is higher where the um, firms are a little bit more protected from, from competition. We don't find any um, effect of another measure of, con um, of sector concentration that we use, it's just as typical hirschman herfindahl index. Um, so in terms of learning by exporting, we'll also look at the role of the trade regime. Um, and you know, this is just some literature that is looking at um, the fact that there is heterogeneity and who learns from exporting. Um, so what we want, the question we want to ask ourselves here is why do firms not learn in the pre-WTO period but do once the trade is then liberalised? Um, so again, we look at the costs imposed by the protectionist regime that may make it more difficult for firms to learn. So it's more difficult, they incur much more costs, so it's harder for them to learn in the pre 
PWTO regime. We also could think about the fact that in protected sectors, if you're in a protected sector through tariffs or through just other, other measures, um, inefficient firms can survive for longer. So this might be a reason why we don't see them any learning on average, because the inefficient firms are not being, um, being pushed out. Um, and also firms in protected sectors might be less efficient due to the fact that they're not exposed to competition and so learning can't happen. Um, so what we do is we do a similar type of model to what we have estimated before, but we use the interactions between these other measures that we have, that we have been um, talking about. So first of all, in terms of the high cost export sector, it doesn't seem to make any difference on our results here. What does seem to make a difference is if you're in a protected sector, and this is a very strong result in fact. So any of the benefits or any of the learning effects that we observe in the post-WTO period are, just don't appear in any of the, the, the high tariff sectors. So our result here, I guess, is that you know, learning is, not, is much less likely um, where you've got other types of protection in place. It's much more likely where sectors are competitive. Okay, so let's skip that bit and go to the third part of our analysis, which is looking at technology transfers. And here we're exploring one of the channels, you know, there's very little known about learning effects um, in, in, in the literature. It's kind of more, in more recent years, people have been trying to disentangle how learning actually happens. So, you know, what you export matters, it seems, who you export to matters, it also seems, and also it seems that export participation is associated with, with investment. But we, what we do here is use this, um, this module that in our data, we only have two years of data for this, so we're slightly limited in terms of, of what kind of econometric analysis we can do. But what we're looking at is looking at the, rela the same relationship as before, this learning by exporting relationship, um, and we estimate th the same model as before, except we disaggregate our export variable into different types of exporting. And this is based on a question that we, that we ask the firm. So we can disaggregate whether you export uh, final goods or intermediate goods, and we can um, disaggregate this further by um, a, ver a question which, which asks the firm, did you experience a technology transfer as a result of this? Um, and when we do this analysis, the same analysis as before, um, we find, okay, the positive um, export um, relationship between your export and productivity. We find that it holds for both final goods and intermediate goods, so there's no real distinction there, and it holds for firms that have technology transfers and those that don't have technology transfers. So it doesn't appear to be that there's, you know, there is technology transfers happening, but it's not the only part of the story, it's one part of the story. But what we do see is that um, um, when we disaggregate by final goods and intermediate goods, it's firms that export intermediate goods and say that they experience a technology transfer that experience this greater um, learning effect. So this provides some evidence of backward linkages through the um, international supply chain. So just to summarize then, we find that productive firms self-select into export markets in both the pre and post WTO regime, but learning effects are only observed in the more liberalized trade environment. Um, this led us to kind of investigate this a bit further, and there's three key findings regarding the other mechanisms that we've investigated. Um, in terms of self-selection, it seems that lowering trade costs will assist in the self-selection process. But selection of productive firms into export markets is more likely in, se in sectors that are themselves protected from, from imports. Um, learning by, in terms of learning by exporting, we don't find any evidence that the cost of exporting impacts on the learning process, but firms in protected sectors are actually much less likely to experience these learning effects. Um, in terms of technology transfers, we do find learning by exporting effects are the greatest for exporters of intermediate goods, and this is most likely, as we saw on the previous uh, table, attributed to technology transfers. So that's it.